It gives us great pleasure to welcome you all today to this special event, a discussion on the book, British Takeover of India, Modus Operandi, by the late Dr. K.P. Agarwal. And I'm happy to share with you that his daughter, uh, Pallavi Agarwal, is also with us today. So that's a great honor for us. It's a work based on meticulous research and documentation of reams of archival material. And uh, this publication has been brought out again uh, by INTAC in partnership with Aryan Books International uh, to mark our country's Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and perhaps also to re-examine some learnings from the not so distant past, uh, have a better appreciation of the present and uh, while at the same time looking uh, to the future. So I'm especially uh, honored to welcome and invite now on our stage uh, our distinguished panelists for today, Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Dr. Sanjeev Chopra. <laughs> Dr. Swapandas Gupta is on his way, and hopefully he'll be here soon. He's caught in a traffic jam. He just messaged. So please do join us. So uh, we take this opportunity uh, to release the most recent of Intax publications and uh, would request Dr. Chopra to do the honors for this. My colleague Poonima will tell you a little bit about it. So good evening to everyone. So the publication we are releasing today is very, very unique. It's the Hornbill Warrior which is a story come a coloring book which brings out the heritage and culture of Nagaland as discovered through the eyes of a young girl from Nagaland. Intax Heritage Education and Communication Service Division undertook the translation of this book in five languages to increase the outreach as well as to promote the preservation of endangered languages of India. So today we are happy to release the Hornbill Warrior in the Lotha language and the Ao language. So I request Dr. Sanjeev Chopra to release the books. Thank you, Poonima. Now, I know our panel really needs no introduction, but it behoves me to do so nonetheless. Uh, Dr. Shashi Tharu, a third term member of parliament for Thiruvananthapuram, is the best selling author of 24 books, both fiction and non fiction, besides being a former Under Secretary General of the United Nations and a former Minister of State for Human Resource Development and for External Affairs in the Government of India. He has won numerous awards, including the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, a Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and the Crossword Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2019, Dr. Tharoor was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award in the category of English Nonfiction for his book, An Era of Darkness. Welcome, sir. Dr. Swapandas Gupta, who is awaited, but let me introduce him anyway, is uh, one of India's most widely read political columnists for the past three decades, having worked in almost all the leading publications in India in senior editorial positions. He has been an independent columnist since 2003. Mr. Das Gupta was educated at St. Stephen's College and received his doctorate from SOAS in 1980. He was subsequently a research fellow at Oxford. In 2015, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan by the President of India. He is a member of the National Executive of the BJP and was a member of the Rajya Sabha from 2016 to 2022. Our third panelist for today is Dr. Sanjeev Chopra. He's also moderating the discussion. He's a columnist and historian, 
a former civil servant and former director of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration at Masuri. He is the author of the book, We the People of the States of Bharat, The Making and Remaking of India's Internal Boundaries. He is also the festival director at Valley of Words, an international literature and arts festival at Dehradun. Thank you, sir. Welcome. And over to you, Dr. Chopra. Thank you very much, Narupma, and uh, welcome, Shashi. Friends, it's a, it's a record of sorts because uh, chairs have run out. Therefore, obviously, uh, it's been a, it's a session that we're all looking forward to. And the book that we're going to be discussing today is The British Takeover of India. Uh, you know, it's a phenomenal book because it's a book uh, written by Mr. K.P. Agarwal, first published in 1969, uh, and therefore now published after four decades. Now, it also shows that the relevance of the book continues. And uh, frankly, when I read this book, you know, one of the most remarkable, I'll speak a bit longer because we're waiting for our, we're waiting for our panelists who have to stretch it a bit. Uh, and once the mic is given to Mr. Tharoor, then, you know, no one can take it back from him. <laughs> so, <clears throat> So, you know, the advantages of, of not having a, having a panelist so far. Now, the friends, the point is that, uh, you know, there are many conceptions in our mind. And the reading of this book is so important because it broke two very important myths that were there in my mind. One, that Mir Jafar was a great traitor. Now, reading this book, you realize that Mir Jafar was not the traitor that he is made out to be. That popular history always carries some myth, and that myth then continues and continues and continues. But if you go to the root of it, you realize that Mir Jafar was actually far more sensible and far more creative in his, in his negotiations with the British than many others were. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, and the second was that, you see, coming from Punjab and especially from the state of Kapurthala, uh, which has been really, you know, brought down in this book because Kapurthala along with the other states of, uh, of Patiala and the others, has actually been shown uh, to be those which supported the British during the mutiny. So one felt a little, you know, one, one felt uh, uh, there was a little sense of, you know, what we did in Kaputla and Patiala, because they could, but the point that was, you know, that we had this feeling that Lawrence brothers were great administrators in Punjab. You know, that was a myth with which I had grown up with, that, you know, the Lawrence brothers really settled Punjab, that from 19, 1848 to 1947 was the best period of Punjab. One realizes this is not true. Uh, you know, the, the imperial character of John Lawrence also comes out in this book very clearly. So reading this book is very important because many of the, many of the conceptions that we have about various people, that gets demolished. Uh, but now that our panelist is also here, let me say that, you know, the, the advantage of the written word, the advantage of the written word is that it is always there. You know, it resurrects. So a treaty, a sanad or something is always there. But reinterpretations will always take place. Because history is not just about facts, but also about putting facts in perspective. And that's even more important than getting the fact. And I think this is one thing which, uh, which uh, this book really brings to, to light. You know, the way the empire uh, was able to control us, not just monetarily, not just militarily, but mentally. I think one of the things which comes out of the book is that each treaty, each sanad, each agreement that they made was done very cleverly and very intelligently. And the use of English language, the very clever use of English language. Uh, the British also did something very interesting. Some treaties were signed by the local resident. Some treaties were signed by the governor of Bengal, by the governor of the Madras presidency. So these, if the British didn't find convenient, they would say, well, the governor general doesn't agree. If something was not convenient, they would say, well, the governor general agrees, but the secretary of state does not agree. You know, so they had these layers. Whereas we, I mean, most of the Indian princes and the Rajas and Maharajas did not have the advantage of layering their agreements. So I think that was another aspect which comes out in this book very clearly. Uh, there's another friend of ours from the 89 batch, Meeta Rajiv Loch, and she's written a book calling Making India Great Again, and she's read some very seminal points which are also relevant and which I'll also ask you about. One was that, you know, they, we have to give credit to the East India Company for two or three things. One, that they paid their army regularly, whereas the Marathas and the Sikhs and the, and the Mughals, all of them were in default. So you have two kinds of armies, an army which has not been paid for three months, 
and an army which has been paid regularly. So naturally, the army which has been paid regularly will do well. Second, each of the Indian soldiers, whether a Maratha or a Sikh, till the time the French started training the uh, training Ranjit Singh's army, they were supposed to get their own sword, their own cavalry, their own horse, and, and take care of that. But in the case of the East India Company and the Britishers, they were taking care of all the ammunition and all the resources, which made a lot of difference. Another fact was that they started the disability pension. So I think these are all things which helped them. And of course, we didn't have that kind of, uh, uh, kind of an understanding of the nation because the Marathas and the Sikhs and the Mughals, if they had been together, things would have been very different. But uh, my job is to provoke or you know, sort of invoke our uh, distinguished panel. Uh, I had a set of seven questions, but Shashi tells me that I should ask them individually and not together because it should be a conversation format. Very interestingly, today, Mr. Tharoor is on the right. <laughs> And uh, you're on the left, sir. It says a lot. I, like a retired bureaucrat, am in the center and firmly from in the From the audience's center. point of view, Chopin is where he belongs. <laughs> right, so the point, the first question which I want to raise uh, uh, is that, you know, whenever a central authority, whether a central authority is essential to limit and control the centripetal tendencies in our country, and this is what happened not just with the Mughals, but also with the Mauryas, with the, with, the, uh, with the Mauryas, with the Guptas, with the Kushans. So uh, maybe you could start with this, uh, Shashi. Sure. I mean, I, I do want to say one brief thing at the very beginning, which is, first of all, to congratulate Intac on this uh, occasion, first of all, of reprinting the book, and secondly, for convening such a very impressive standing room only audience. So congratulations to Intac for doing this, to the chairman <laughs> and the staff, and, and to all of you who've come, because it's extremely important that our cultural and historical heritage be the subject of conversation and discussion as it's going to be this evening. Uh, I might add a personal note of regret. As you all know, I wrote a book about the British takeover and running of India called An Era of Darkness. And I was trying to look for Dr. Agarwal's book, which was published in 1979, which I'd heard about, but no one could find me a copy for love or for money. Uh, and there were bootleg copies of various out-of-print books available digitally, but this wasn't available either. And one of the most invaluable things about it is that there are 39 treaties that he has assembled, some of which have not been assembled anywhere else, word for word, reproduced faithfully by this wonderful scholar. And uh, now Intact brings it out. I wish I had there only done it sort of seven years earlier than I could have used it in my book. It would have made for a better book. But uh, thank you nonetheless for bringing out uh, uh, this, this extremely detailed compilation. I, I just wanted to say that um, Yes, I mean, the lack of a central authority. In theory, we had a central authority because the Mughal emperor was still in existence and, and the Mughal empire, everyone was quite happy to pay nominal uh, allegiance, uh, even though in practice, however, their authority did not extend. Anyway, for example, it would surprise you to realize that uh, as late as uh, 1739, when Nadir Shah came and sacked Delhi, that uh, the Nizam of Hyderabad, was nominally somebody who owed allegiance to the Mughal emperor, came up and tried to settle things and, and, and pay off the, the Persians and push them off. So there was, in theory, a central authority, but de facto, the central authority really had no power, did not extend um, much beyond the precincts of Delhi. And the result was that in many, many places, uh, the British were able to push their way around. You do know that they started off with a firman, uh, from the Mughal emperor that gave them the Diwani of uh, Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. And that uh, was their, their sort of first fundamental legal uh, foothold, which is also in the, in the book. But subsequently, uh, they did all sorts of things to expand because each Indian potentate, Maharaja, Nawab, whatever you want to call them, were all pretty weak. And frankly, what the British used were classic mafiosi tactics. I mean, it's something that was perfected some centuries later in, in, in Italy. But the, the British had it down pat. They would go to a small Maharaja and say, you know, um, my gosh, you need to pay us 10,000 gold coins a month for your protection. Otherwise, you know, you could be seriously attacked. And the guy would say, but I don't need protection. Who are my enemies? Who's going to attack me? And the British would say, we are. So, uh, so very promptly, they would be, uh, they would be uh, uh, allowed to sort of park themselves in the uh, Maharaja's domains. They would be paid for by the Maharaja's treasury. And very often, in fact, the men uh, of the 
of the British contingent would be recruited from amongst the subjects of the Maharaja. And, uh, and, and uh, he would essentially be paying his own people to protect him from his own people uh, while the British sat on top of it. And amongst the other things, the British, I mean, there was, so, there was such an incredible racket that um, in, the, in the first decade of the 19th century, for example, the British had stationed on the same premises a, a rather large uh, contingent of troops in Hyderabad. Uh, and they told the Nizam, number one, that he would have to pay the salaries that the company decided he would have to pay. So for example, the British company commander had the most exorbitant salary of 5,000 pounds a month, which he couldn't have made in a year in the UK had he been uh, commanding troops there. And what is more, because all of this is far more than the Nawab's, uh, I mean the Nizam's uh, resources could easily provide for, the British governor general had a British friend of his set up a bank from which the Nizam could borrow money at 24% interest to pay, <laughs> pay his dues to the British. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the entire operation, they came in first as traders, as we all know, and then from the trading, they decided that it was far more profitable to trade at the end of a gun. By taking on the firman, they then became revenue collectors. They exacted four times more revenue than had ever been extracted before. And they spent the money that they'd extracted from the Indians to purchase items uh, from the Indians at lower prices than they would otherwise have got without any competition to drive the prices up. And of course, the profits were repatriated straight to England. And all this is, is, is rather effectively described as well in this monumental work by Dr. Agarwal. Thank you so much. And uh, again, the same question, Sapan, to you. Uh, thank uh, you very much, Sanjeev. Firstly, let me apologize for uh, the delay in getting here. You know, these are some of the liabilities of not living in Latin's Delhi is that you get stuck in traffic jams, which are oh, quite You guys said Lutian's Delhi, no? <laughs> That's changing. Shashi, I'm so glad that the populist touch has finally got to you. <laughs> uh, Merely Stephanie in humor, old chap. Uh, well, well, thank you very much. Uh, for firstly, le let me compliment uh, Intac for uh, republishing this book, which has been sadly out of print, and it's the first time I've really got to read it. In sec I, have, I must confess, I haven't been able to go through the entire book, but most of it. Uh, I think it's very important in two respects. I think number one, is oh, uh, first is that of course we are in the process of rediscovering our history, which I think is it's quite evident. It's also contentious, but the process is ongoing. The second important thing, which I think is equally uh, valid, is that we are in the process of rescuing our history from historians. <laughs> And I say this with a degree, degree of premeditation, because I think if there's anyone who's been responsible for the vulgarization, the distortion, it's not so much the British, it's our own historians. So this endeavor of Dr. Agarwal, along with various others, there, there's been a set of five books, for example, uh, on the Peshwas, written by a person who was a former arm, army surgeon, Mr. Uday Kulkarni in Pune. And it's worth going through them. And he's also gone through the actual documents and act, printed it. And it gives a very, very different picture of the entire Maratha Confederacy than has been known. So it's important, therefore, to take into account these books. There are a lot of people who insist that his history only belongs to the historians. I would beg to disagree very, very strongly about that. Now on the question of the central authority, which Sanjeev pointed out. Now, if you look at the documents on Indian statecraft, you'll find that there's one thing which stares you in the face, which is, that while India in many ways was a nation, the idea of state was very, very fragile. It was con consisted of many kingdoms, but all these kingdoms were not necessarily antagonistic to each other. They more or less complemented each other. They were built on local cultures. They were built on local foundations. And it's important to recognize this, that the idea of 
the European state, the Westphalian state, for example, is not something which came into India till fairly recently. And therefore, those who say India was sort of a hodgepodge of those uh, communities, India was, as, India was much a nation as the equator, you know, one of Churchill's more memorable quotes. Uh, I think they missed the point that you could have a kingdom centered on Banaras. You could have the kingdom of Banaras where the temples were made by the Marathas who were not anyway linked with them. You could have similar sort of things everywhere. You could have pilgrimage centers, which were a very, very important linkages in India. If you go to any of the major pilgrimage centers, you'll find the genealogies. And I'm sure, Shashi, you would probably go to uh, uh, Banaras and you'll find probably someone of your ancestry from Kerala who'd gone there. Certainly, I know in Bengal, we travel considerably to Puri, to Banaras, etc. So the idea of nationhood, etc., was a bit different. We had what was India, Bharat, Hindustan, some people would call it later. But that did not necessarily mean a central authority. The idea of the central authority came in when certain basic civilizational assumptions were challenged. Now, when it was challenged, I think, I, I, I don't want to raise that question because that itself is a uh, minefield of a subject uh, was there. But I think, it, as far as the British were concerned when they came in, they had a very, very different civilizational outlook than most of India, which they didn't necessarily share. It took, took them a very, very long time to understand it. When Mill wrote his history of British India, they never even come to in India at all. And there were other very distinguished scholars of the civil services particularly, and most of the scholars were from the civil services. Uh, and they wrote the gazetteers, for example, are still priceless in terms of their documentation. And I mean, the British had a natural sense of documentation which is something which in India we bank more on the oral tradition. We didn't document half the things. We had a guru and there was a shishya. Knowledge was passed from guru to the shishya and that was it. It was not necessarily recorded ever. These traditions didn't exist in India. I would say that that was one of our shortcomings. But it, that tradition did not exist in India. And in a similar sort of way, as far as the central authority is concerned, the need for a central authority was not felt for a very long time. So when you look, look at it, when Mir Jafar entered into a, a sort of a backdoor arrangement with the East India Company, he didn't necessarily think he was violating all the tenets of his dharma. Absolutely. In fact, that treaty is between him and the... It, it was and, and, and similar, and I think Dr. Agarwal points out, similar arrangements by Raghuva, the Peshwa pretender, he made similar arrangements, which were sometimes disowned by the British according to their convenience, etc. So that idea that you were actually changing the very civilization of India, the changing the very face of India, did not act, uh, did not seep into the consciousness of those who were at the helm of political authority. Absolutely. And I think it's very important, and I make this final point before I pass it on to you, is that, of course, the perfidy, Albion's perfidy has been wonderfully recorded by uh, Dr. Agarwal, and I think that's become even a subject, it's become even conventional wisdom as far as Britain itself is concerned to say how disgraceful its own history is. Well, I'm not necessarily going into that. Of course, there is a lot of skullduggery, uh, underhand dealings, unethical practices, etc., which wouldn't stand up to conventional uh, wisdom today. But at the same time, it's important to realize, and I think this is a point we have to think, is that a very large, thick, very large part of the British endeavor in India was facilitated because of the collaboration of Indians themselves. Absolutely. I think it's uh, 
both the speakers have made some very pertinent points, and I think the whole concept of nationhood, how we looked at ourselves. In fact, if you look at the very first three shlokas of the Gita, where the conversation is that which are the armies on the Pandava side and which are the armies on the Kaurava side, basically they had this idea that there is a Bharat and a Mahabharat and you had the Kosal Raj and many other Rajas. But moving on to the discussion that we have, Shashi, one of the points which comes out is that, you know, the British were a nation of shopkeepers, traders, and record keepers. And I think this record keeping helped them a lot, which we were not doing. So you're collecting the choth, you know, but nobody knew what that choth would be. But as far as the Brits are concerned, they made it very clear, 50,000 rupees in this and this currency. So do you think this uh, lack of a mercantile culture or this, you know, this, this very uh, positive interface that should take place between the mercantile class and the ruling class, you know, uh, the breakup of that uh, gave a chance to the British to did what they did. Yes and no, only up to a point, Sanjeev. I'll, say, I'll tell you why. Because we actually had a very sophisticated financial network in India at the time the British came. The Jagat Sates were actually uh, operating and sending money around the country. Uh, that was about three times larger than the entire operations of the Bank of England. Uh, and, and, um, and they were doing so perhaps not in the way in which a Western banking enterprise would have recorded it. But they knew what they were doing, and they made and unmade entire rajas and kingdoms and so on. In fact, one of the great misfortunes for us was that they actually decided that they would back and finance the British East India Company to overthrow Siraj Udala because he'd insulted uh, one of the, their top people. All of these kinds of intrigues and incidents happened, and as Chopin pointed out, we, we were so divided amongst ourselves that it, it wasn't actually all that anomalous that an Indian banker would finance uh, a coup by uh, a foreign uh, company quote unquote, against an Indian ruler, though of course abetted by that Indian ruler's own aid and, and cousin. Now you've got all of this kind of stuff going on. I, I wanted to read actually a couple of lines from Dr. Agarwal's masterly summary of the, the, the financial techniques of the British. He, he said, and he's paraphrasing, so he says, in other words, the British said, you pay us money to raise a force from your people to protect you. The force in order to be effective and efficient will be trained by us and will remain under our control and protection, those stationed in your territory. Further, this force may be posted anywhere in your territory or even outside at our will. To avoid default in payment for maintenance of the forces, you better cede us territories to yield equivalent contribution. Since we are maintaining a force to protect you, what is the point in your maintaining a separate army of your own? Reduce it sub substantially. Its reduction is necessary if you are to balance your budget after payment of your tribute to us and avoid falling into heavy debt. Since you've oppressed your people by realizing extra money to balance your budget to pay us, such <coughs> whether the, the tribute, as he points out, to the British was 40 to 80 percent of the total revenue uh, of, of most of these kingdoms, plus extra charges for aid rendered, then that makes you a villain. So why should you, we not take over the management of your state, or depose you, or annex your state in lieu of heavy outstanding debts? I mean, this, this essentially was, is his summary of the modus operandi by which the East India Company expanded its way. And it's quite remarkable. Uh, this is exactly what they did, for example, in South India to the Nawab of Arcot, uh, who, um, again, station, troops were stationed there. His own people were hired. They were paid salaries. The East India Company determined. This fellow ended up uh, uh, being unable to pay the debts because the outgoings to the British exceeded his revenues. So British said, fine, you pay us in territory. And the next thing the guy knew, he was reduced to basically his palace. Everything else had been taken over by the British. That's one of the many ways in which the British expanded. Uh, but on the question of record keeping, it should be mentioned that they were, uh, uh, in fact, if anything, the meticulousness uh, of doing things by the book uh, turned out to be an absolute curse of British rule in India. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, in the past, there was always something informal, even about taxation and revenue collection. Uh, for example, a, a, a small landholder had a death in the family or a serious illness, or there was a famine or a drought or whatever, and the chap would do, you know, there's no, there was this informality with which these things were, were, were managed. Um, and, and that disappeared with the Brits. The Brits preferred to work through intermediaries, they themselves did not actually maintain any relationship with the people they were exploiting. So what they did essentially was establish everything through written rules, written books, written books of accounts and ledgers. And those had to be up to date and accurately done. So for example, it didn't matter if there was a famine or a drought. 
If you had to pay 5,000 rupees this month, you had to pay 5,000 rupees this month, and if necessary, they'd flog you in the public square until you paid it. Uh, this kind of cruelty of exaction is what ensured that the British East India Company multiplied by four to eight the amount of revenue collected in every one of the territories they were in. So everywhere where even you know, people have been groaning under the exactions of the previous Mughal rulers or their subsidiary Nawabs, the British managed to exceed even that in every case by the onerous taxation methods they had. And because they stuck everything in a book, the book was the last word. There was no appeal to common sense or even humanity. It was all done in, in writing. And there, I think Sanjeev has a, has a very valid point. If we look at this, and I've read through in writing my book a lot of testimonies uh, before the House of Commons, the British are quite uh, unembarrassed about admitting that, that all they did was incredibly iniquitous, and they actually did exploit people beyond their capacity to be exploited. And, and uh, some of the horror stories which, which, which we've all read um, are a result of this kind of meticulous financing and bookkeeping. So that's my answer to Sanjeev. I agree with you up to that point. But it's not that we were financially illiterate. We had financiers. We had bankers. It's just that they were not particularly committed to one, one side or the No, I think, Shashi, I think you may have understated the importance of a parallel system of accountancy which uh, existed as far as the Indians were concerned. Uh, I mean, the documents at least found in uh, various parts of the erstwhile Bombay presidency, for example, or even in the Saurashtra region, suggest a couple of things. Firstly, that there was a system of accountancy which was completely different from that which was the practiced by the British. And many of our historians have not been able to crack that. For instance, if you look, look at Thomas Timberg's book on the Marwaris, it, he was one of the very few who actually managed to uh, excavate the logic behind many of the Marwari systems of accountancy. Number two, which is important to acknowledge, is that the while the relationship between the British and many of those subsidiary states was marked by a degree of overtaxation and over extortion. As a result of that, there was a parallel system of subversion which came into play. And this was particularly there in, say, Saurashtra, uh, where the, uh, the small Maharajas, or, you know, the, you know, there were sort of one water pistol salute Maharajas which existed at various points. And they had their own parallel system which ran what might be called the grey economy also existed. It was a form of political subversion which existed through that. And it's important that we should try and document that. One of the tragedies, and I think which uh, 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 Dr. Agarwal has done much to correct, is that there is an impression that the history of the princely states in India is marked by a lot of slavishness and, you know, genuflection to anything great and, you know, uh, that, that's partly true. But I think there was another dimension to it, that there was a quiet level of subversion which was taking place in their own way. Secondly, what has also not been documented is the incredible corruption of the political agents of the British Empire. I think, you know, just as the East India Company was marked by high degree, you know, the, after all, the battle with Mir Qasim, was really about private trade. It was not about the relationship with East India Company, it was about private trade. So likewise, the political agents who were posted to various of these states actually made a fortune and discredited, I would say, the name of the Indian political service, which otherwise had a very glorious tradition in the frontier regions. So that point also, I think, is necessary. So the, uh, the British rule, I think, one, you can always mark it as one which belong uh, from, uh, from, say, 1750s right up to, to the 1830s. That's one. That, that, that's the sort of uh, the, the cruder aspects of that came in. Then from about the 1850s and 60s, you had a more refined version of British rule. The Queen, so yeah, the, I mean, the Queen's proclamation being the sort of turning point on, on, on that. But even within that, you had a system of corruption. So corruption didn't quite end 
with the East India Company, and nor were the ICS as great as is often made out. I mean, there was a senior underside to it as well. And I think it would be worth if some historians can actually get to actually deciphering these documents which still exist I in various parts of India. There's Absolutely. a hilarious think, uh, novel written by an 1850s, 1840s or 50s colonial era civil servant called A. E. Prichard, called The Chronicles of Bajpur, hmm. which is a very sort of thin, thinly disguised account of his own service. And Chopin is totally right. The corruption and the stories of corruption that are deeply... And this is 1840s or 50s we're talking about, before the crown took over. Yeah, that's uh, uh, just, just widespread. You see, the only point which I'd like to add is that East India Company was just following the great Mughal tradition because from the time... Tradition of, of Bakshish. Bakshish and all these things. I mean, imagine that the Maharajas... I mean, the, 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 the emperor, Jahangir's... Uh, own mother and uh, wives and sisters, they agreed to pay Nazrana to the Portuguese for safe passage to for the Hajj. So the, the whole system of corruption and all these things was had become pretty endemic. And I think that started when the when the central, uh, you know, when to, to use another term, you know, when the entire consensus about how the nation has to be governed. Because if we go back to Kotele and the others, it was very clear that the king's part is one sixth of the produce. The Shat Bhag. So the moment that Shat Bhag was broken by the Mughals and then the East India Company and then everything, it happened. But let's move on to the next point. Yeah, but also it's getting is, ridiculous. We're agreeing on each thing. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> that's because you have a good center. You see, you need a bureaucrat to, you know, to, to get, uh, I mean, that's a, a great thing, sir. It's an honor for, for to be in the center. Okay. The other thing is the, 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 the British, and as he pointed out, were curious about us. I mean, they, they read the Upanishads, they read the Quran, they engaged with Maulavis, they engaged with everyone. They started learning about us. But we did not, I mean, when I say we, I mean the Mughals, the Sikhs, the, the, and the Marathas, we did not show as much interest in understanding the adversary, which means that in order to be successful, we need to understand the adversary. And that's something which brings us all to the point about how much we understand China and how much China understands us. And I like uh, both Shashi and Sopan to delve on this and also on how much we understand China and how much China understands us. Okay, well, I think on, on the question, you're totally right that the British did actually systematically study us. Uh, and the so-called Orientalists, the people like uh, William Jones, who set, set up the Asia Society in Calcutta, uh, and, and the, the, the people who mastered various, uh, not just Indian languages, Persian as well, and, and started documenting what they saw. Chopin has already alluded to some of that. And that was indeed a, a, a rather impressive feat in the sense that none of this existed. Of course, they, they may have actually helped codify things that we prefer to leave uncodified. I, I have argued in my book that the, the sort of entrenching and formalizing of the caste system is actually a British colonial legacy because there was a lot of informality about caste that is, that is actually overlooked. There have been other scholars now who've done some pioneering work on this. Um, it, for example, was entirely possible for a per person of a particular caste to migrate to a different territory and assume a different uh, caste identity. And that sort of flexibility actually used to happen, which is something we don't fully recognize. Uh, but the British, of course, wrote everything down, conducted censuses as an instrument of categorizing and cataloging the people they were ruling over, and in the process, ossified certain identities. Um, and we saw this not just in caste religion as well. I mean, I, uh, there's no doubt, for example, that one of the most curious consequences of the <coughs> conquest of Awadh was that the uh, Muharram procession, until the British took over, was actually conducted jointly by the Shias, the Sunnis, and the Hindus. They, 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 they commemorated Muharram every day. There'd never been an incident. And the British came and said, no, 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 according to our books and so on, this is actually a Shia event. They should be in charge, out Sunnis, out Hindus. And the first Shia Sunni riots over Muharram started after the British and under British rule. Because they had absolutely no sense uh, for uh, the informality and the, and the possibilities for outclauses and escape, as it were, that we had uh, in the way in which we, we ran our systems. I mean, uh, Wajid Ali Shah, the Nawab of Awad, actually used to conduct a Krishna Leela every year on Janmashtami. He directed a play and his begums were the, were the gopis. 
dancing around. Uh, he wasn't the Krishna, there was some other actor or dancer. You were sitting there as the director, producer, enjoying. Are you it. sure you weren't there? <laughs> <laughs> in some other form or format. <laughs> Maybe in a previous incarnation, I might well have of enjoyed course, that. Of course, of uh, course. Uh, well. But having said that, I mean, look at, for example, what the Brits did in Bengal. They got a bunch of Brahmins to write what they call the Code of Gentu Laws. And the Brahmins, needless to say, with all respect to, to individuals of that persuasion, wrote down a series of what the British then assumed to be the, the practices of Hinduism, which glorified and exalted their clout and power in the system. And that, that then became the received wisdom and what was more the law of the land and the practices that had to be followed. Uh, so yes, the British tried to understand us, tried to study us, fair enough. But in the process, they also distorted our reality and in some ways changed our reality. Now, your question about whether we studied them, uh, probably not. I mean, we, they were by and large a hated enemy and we, we, uh, the, the people of that time uh, spent time trying to overcome them. There were, of course, the, the, the Indian imitators, and I don't blame them, people who felt that now that the Brits were here and they're entrenched, we may as well be as much like them as possible. And so not studied them as adversaries, but studied them as, as, as people worth emulating. Uh, I've often pointed out that we're, what we forget when we talk about English education in India is that um, the British themselves spent a tiny amount of money on educational institutions in India, absolutely tiny, a handful of colleges. Uh, they actually, uh, Will Durant, when he came here in 1930, discovered that the entire education expenditure of the government of British India was smaller than the high school budget of the state of New York. But Indians spent money. So for one presidency college that's, that's in, that was created by the British, you have half a dozen or eight colleges, I think, established by Ramo and Roy alone in, in Calcutta and Bengal, also teaching in English and also offering the kind of instruction the British were doing. But the Indians were doing it for themselves at their expense and, and, and on their own lands and territories. So that's just by way of a side thing. On China, I would argue that while there is a the vast areas of ignorance that I suspect from what I have seen, and I'm not an authority on China, I do believe that our scholars' knowledge of, interest in, and study of China vastly exceeds uh, the, 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 the Chinese interest in us, uh, simply because, and I've heard this from non-interested parties, neither Indians nor Chinese, that the Chinese tend to look upon India, unfortunately, with a fair degree of contempt. And they don't consider it particularly worth studying. There's a handful of India scholars in China, and many of them are pretty ancient by now, because that period when they began their studies, the 50s and 60s, uh, later on, basically, India was seen by the Chinese establishment as irrelevant and as not even worth studying. So I would say that, yes, this ignorance can one day harm us, um, but, but I, I do believe that there's a, there's a greater uh, body of scholarship in India and systematic study of China and India than I'm aware of on the other side. Yeah. Uh, may I just uh, just take this take this discussion to another plane? Uh, yesterday, I happened to be in the Indian Museum. I was showing some people around, and the curator showed showed me a gallery of uh, the Indian of, Museum in Calcutta. Yeah, we, although it was a holiday, I just managed to get in for some other reason, uh, and he showed me a. a a small collection from the Gandhara school, which I said, well, the Peshawar has the largest collection of Gandhara art. Uh, but he said, quite, not quite. Most of it is lying untapped in the basement of the Indian Museum, and we hope to soon exhibit it, etc. Now, what also came through was that most of the initial collection was inherited from the Asiatic society. Now, Sanjeev, you've served in these parts, so you might be familiar with, with it. Now, if you go to the Asiatic Society in Calcutta now, you'd want to cry. Want to cry. Yeah. You want to cry. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a miracle if any of the actual manuscripts survive. It's the complete disdain with which we often treat our institutions. There's a lovely manuscript in the National Archives, very well preserved, some Dogri things. Uh, a, an old Dogri manuscript. When I asked the person how many have read it, he said, probably there are two pe there are two individuals in the whole world who probably can decipher that, and none of them are in India. The entire tradition of Indology, 
what we might call Indology, which was so rich in India, has died. It died not because the Britain killed it, but because we killed it after independence. In this, in, in, in this search for the scientific temper, uh, a phrase much loved by Shashi, uh, we just looked at the temper part of it. <laughs> no, we looked at the science. And the but inheritance the of India was, the, was completely low. And it comes to the question of why, why I'm coming here is, is the question of China. There was a, India's sort of interest in China has always been through Tibet. I think this is important to realize that we never really engaged with the rest of the Han heartland. We engaged very profoundly with Tibet. And there was a very rich scholarship. You know, you heard of Raghuveer and people like that, and people earlier than that. that the entire collection of Tibetan manuscripts, the, uh, the study of Tibetan theology. In, in, incidentally, theology as a subject does not exist in India. It's been merged somewhere into philosophy because I think it's a non-kosher non word, a non-kosher <laughs> subject. Uh, so that tradition of actually engaging with the foreign, with cultures which are slightly outside our pale has, has systematically been whittled down. When we were students together at St. Stephen's, we had a, a paper in the first year of our history course on British history. I enjoyed that. Now, a lot of people used to say, why the hell are we learning British history? For a very simple reason, if you're going to understand modern India, and if you don't know British history, you're going to miss out a quite a lot of it. That's the plain fact, but it's been discarded because we don't need to know it. So why we have globalized, we've also turned quite insular at the same time. Both processes have gone on simultaneously. And I think in the, in, in the study of history, that is quite evident in terms of how we've faltered in learning the classical languages, in terms of learning the old, old Sanskrit or any of the old thing, even uh, something as the old Maratha script is hardly known, and that's not that old. It's hardly known. You hardly get any scholars who can actually read that. As a result, our study of history has suffered grievously and un unless some of the universities take corrective action and move away from the sort of modes of production debates, uh, I, I think we are going to fund it. And China will, our uh, knowledge of the wider world will suffer consequently. We need to tone up quite a lot on that. Good, there are some sparks, some sparkle, but still not we've not quite. had the, not we quite. We agree, I think. Not quite, I mean, that's very interesting. I mean, it's JNU and Stephens on both sides, and still <laughs> we're not being able to create or anything. Okay, let's talk about asymmetry. You see, one of the things is that uh, there was a major asymmetry amongst the contracting parties, but I think that's not a question because I think all of us are agreed that there was an asymmetry. Uh, the other thing, you know, is that uh, the Britishers, I think, realized that it's far more important to write history, you know, to write history correctly rather than whatever happened because the British have never talked about their defeat in Afghanistan, their defeat in Tibet, their misadventures, you know, they never talked about it. So, but it's uh, been documented. I mean, documented, they documented yes, it they, fairly well. Yeah, I mean, they actually, we don't read those books. Sure, they, they, they do talk about it. They mythologize it. They make yeah. great heroes. I mean, great that one yeah. surviving yeah. fellow... I mean, the last man in the, the horse, horse and things like that. The last man in the you know, the last man in life. But in the sense that they've, they just... I mean, like the battle of Saragiri and all, we had to resurrect it. So, but anyway, again, there's no controversy on this. So, again, <laughs> there is no... Uh, my job is very tough to do. I thought there'll be, you know, there'll be a lot of things. So, maybe we'll... Huh? So I thought nothing. that Chopin would be the Anglophile for the occasion, well, but today he's turning out to be a nationalist. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, if the Brit <laughs> well, what, what can you be an Anglophile about? If the British have lost their own sense of their own values, you can't really de defend it any longer. <laughs> okay, friends, so what we'll do is let's open it up for the house. Uh, there are people with mics around, and uh, you can just get up uh, and raise a question to either the left or the right. And the mic will come to you, and as soon as the mic reaches you. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
first here, then we go there with the Ghadwali cap, then we come there, then fourth, and then we, you'll have to raise your hands again because I won't be able to keep a track. Yes, ma'am. So I'm uh, Shruti Podar, and I represent Intac in the region of Shekhawati, which is, uh, you mentioned it, the Marwaris, and what we didn't mention was their accounting system, the Bahi Khatas. In fact, I just wanted to uh, uh, say that, uh, or ask, why are we not going deeper into the study of these texts, which are still there? You know, I found Bahi Khatas and letters since 1840, uh, which I have in my possession today. And these, the Mori script, these scripts are going, these uh, uh, languages we are forgetting. So if we study it, we, get, uh, we would get an idea into the intangible heritage, the social order of that time, through the account books. What did they buy? Yes. What did they covet? So there's a lot of the social order that we are missing out on, not just the financial uh, thing, because I remember if the Raja took away the Bahi Khatas from the states, their life would end because everything was dependent on them. So I think this is a very important study, and I wonder how we can work with governments, with institutions, to get back the knowledge of those languages and to get back uh, the de deciphering of those times and those sure. lifestyles. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you will go first. Well, one of the things is I think we have to reinvent our value systems to a large extent. You know, is this important? Now, uh, for example, if, how many people in our sort of social milieu actually study Sanskrit in university? Because it's not thought to be sexy enough. It's not put on par with, say, for instance, the classics in a British university, where it's, there's a certain premium, intellectual premium attached to that. As a result, so I would say more than government help, it's that one of the first things we need to do is to highlight the importance that these are subjects which are worthwhile. And these are subjects will also have a certain social cachet, if I may say it so. Uh, maybe that's a very unconventional way of looking at it, but I, I, I believe that you know, we've got to do it in that sense. You know, the government funds and all that comes in, private initiative, et cetera, can come in, and um, the Marwari community is always um, there to lend they a very generous helping hand in this. Yeah. <laughs> Any leg to come? OK. Uh, yes, please. Please pass the mic, na? Hey, bhai, mic unko dijiya. And there, Rupa, can we have two, three mics moving in three different directions? Otherwise, you know, they... Uh, yes, uh, so I'm Dhruv Shah from Natural Heritage Division of Intac. Mm -hmm. So since we have talked a bit on the topic and we often don't discuss the effect British had on the natural heritage of India, so what according to you was the impact of the Macaulayism on our perception of on our natural heritage, which we are still mostly ignorant about? When you say natural, did you say natural heritage? Natural, natural, natural heritage. Sir. As in flora and fauna and so Flora, fauna. I'm sorry Vietnam. to say the British did a better job than we've ever done of documenting all of that. They had botanists coming out on those early ships who actually did amazing drawings and, and cataloging of all the stuff. The botanical gardens in Calcutta were set, set up by the Brits. So I, I don't think we can blame them for that. In fact, the reason we have a major chai industry is because the Brits, having unsuccessfully tried to smuggle chai from China, tea leaves from China, uh, with an improbable sort of secret mm -hmm. agent to the name of Robert Fortune, mm -hmm. who actually went and stole tea bushes, brought them back, and they all died on the way. And then a Scotsman discovered the tea plant growing wild in Assam. And, and, and that's why we have a tea industry. So, I mean, I, that's the one thing where I'm not particularly I'm not sure. sure, sure Shashi, I agree with you at all. If there's uh, the complete decimation of the tiger population of India can be attached. No, that, we'll, we'll, we'll come to we'll, animals. We'll, 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 we'll come to that. That's why I came to that. I was going to say they also decimated a number of our traditional crops in order to grow opium. So, so they did. They did that in order to sell opium to the Chinese, and and they, they cleared vast okay, swathes of forest. I think let's move on to the next question. Yes, okay. uh, Dr. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Anjan Ray. I was particularly. I have not read the book, but I was particularly piqued by the comment that you made about the British protecting principalities from themselves. That threat could not have been credible without military technology. So maybe a commentary on how technology played a role in this conquest, because that seems to have not got addressed so far. Okay. 
Will you please take the mic this side now? We need to give some equity in the center. Yes, please take it there. I think the short answer is that their military capacities, uh, they, the, the sophistication of their weaponry and of their military tactics definitely prevailed. It's not that Indians weren't brave fighters, but we were still stuck in somewhat older fashioned ways of doing things. And, and that's why the Brits did as well as they did. And they trained Indian soldiers to fight their way. So you're quite right. Would you like to add? Or? Yeah. I mean, just a small example, if you look at uh, yeah. the beleaguered British uh, garrison who were stuck on the ridge uh, in 1857, and uh, the fact that they could survive that and wait for the counteroffensive while the, uh, the uh, so-called mutineers had <coughs> run of them, uh, complete run of Delhi, and they couldn't do anything about it. It's just a very small example, but it tells you that on top, more than equipment, as much as equipment, there was a sense of military discipline, military aptitude, orientation, which probably we had lost somewhere. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Theru, Dr. Das, though my question is somewhat related to the previous question, and uh, I think all the panelists here have alluded to the you know, the sense of institutional superiority, I would say, the Joint Stock Company or the Standing Army, which is paying its soldiers regularly and a very crafty, you know, this, the whole scheme of uh, treaties and so on and so forth. Now, with this kind of an institutional framework in place, I mean, this is a more of a historian thing because we may not have the data to, you know, give a, uh, concrete, uh, a definite answer. But is there, was there a sense of inevitability that regardless of what happened in the battles, so if you see the first Anglo-Maratha war, the first Anglo-Mysore war, even the Ang first Anglo-Sikh war, and certainly the first Anglo-Afghan war, it was the British who were, it's the East India Company's army, which was initially at the receiving end. But ultimately, the British overcame the odds and they won. So A, a sense of historical inevitability in what was happening due to our institutional weakness, and B, if it was so, then why is it that the British East India Company, which was not as professionally organized as perhaps the Dutch East India Company was, or which was not so beautifully led by the state as the French East India Company was, why did the British East India Company uh, triumph ultimately? Or is it one of those things, mystery about history that the individual stake, yeah. uh, you know, the center Maybe stage? Would like to take this first? Well, it's an interesting perspective. I mean, I, I've never thought about it that way. There's certain sort of mental the Inevitability, I mean, you'd been defeated in your mind be before you actually lost the battle. That's probably what you're trying to say. No, not really. This is post facto. We lost in our mind. You lose first, yeah. then you, you know, 10 years later, you fight a battle and you win again. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, like yeah, I, I wouldn't yeah. say there was inevitability. I would say that every battle was entered, entered into by both sides and the expectation that either could prevail. Um, uh, the fact is that, as you rightly said, they took their blows. They regrouped, they reorganized themselves, came back and fought and won again. And so if you look at the campaigns in a steady period from Plassey in 1757 to the sort of definitive wars of the early 19th century, which pretty much ended uh, the process of British conquest, uh, the British were doing things very systematically. In fact, one of the most dishonest and hypocr hypocr hypocritical statements the Brits made about their conquest of India was that famous line that we acquired India in a fit of absent-mindedness. I, I don't I think they said that so much about India. I think it was said in a larger context about Africa. Of empire. No, of empire, empire as a whole. But it was said by, uh, in a particular hearing about no, India. That, we, I, I mean, the, that question is about, did, was there a philosophy behind the empire? I mean, apart from trade and, you know, self-aggrandizement, mm -hmm. was there a larger philosophy no, behind the empire? invent one in the second Yeah, I think that was century. invented post facto. That's right. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening. I am Colonel Gopal Verma. Uh, my question is to Dr. Tharoor. Uh, last few years, uh, I think it was 10, 12 years back when Tata's took over uh, that famous uh, yeah. car company hmm. of uh, Britain. Then uh, now the current scenario where the PM of Britain is son-in-law of a famous industrialist businessman. So my imagination may be far-fetched, but do you think that one day we'll be having a panel discussion of reverse of this title, <laughs> Indian takeover of British? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Thiru, Dr. Das Gupta, I'll also request you to answer it. 
that's, 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 that's a good one. I'm not sure it requires a formal reply. Actually, just to complete the reply I was giving our friend earlier, uh, there is a book on the joint stock companies and the role of companies. It just came out it's on my desk called Empire Incorporated. I haven't read it yet, but I think it's, the theme is entirely on the question of, of the, the role played by... Yeah. But coming back to your thing, sir, uh, the, the Indians uh, have been present in England for a very long time. The, the first recorded Indian goes back to the 1500s. Um, and, and the first conversion of an Indian to Christianity by the Archbishop of Canterbury was in the 16th century. There's, there's a whole lot of amazing history that's available in some of the books. But the Indians never quite took over. They infiltrated, and they're doing very well. <laughs> um, I, I, I do suspect that if you did a kind of Forbes list of the 100 richest people living in Britain, that you'd find a disproportionate number of Indians, uh, probably the largest single ethnic group rather than, rather than white Britons. Nothing okay. really more to add. Yeah? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, how can we decol decolonize the modus operandi of divide and rule? How can we what well, the modus I mean, can, I, I think the, la the better question is, how do we get rid of this sort of language? <laughs> which doesn't mean anything. And I think one of the greatest contributions of this new trend is that they've, I think maybe they call it postmodernism and you know, stuff <laughs> like that, uh, is how they've made entire subjects completely incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, he was saying that how do we, how do we get out of this divide and rule thing? Ah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, if at all it's possible and, you know, things of that sort. To which he said that it's, uh, so I think it's more in the nature of a comment. Let's go there. There's another question there. Yes, ma'am. There. Uh, yes, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Pallavi Agarwal. I just want to ask you, like, one question which was raised from that side regarding uh, what Britishers did for natural things or nature things. I want to give an example from my father's book that when a treaty document was signed with the principality of Mount Abu, which was a very small principality yes. at that time, what did the Indian kings did for the natural things? They, he, when he signed the treaty, that yes, uh, principality, they talked about what things the Britishers will not cut, what animals they'll not kill. And it was a very small principality. Uh, sirs, I want to ask you one question, which uh, is always on my mind, which was his way of thinking. He, he sought, uh, we talk about unity in diversity. This is the word which is generally coined. He said, diverse, you cannot unify diverse elements. He reversed that coinage. He said, diversity in unity, where the, already the country is united. We have the diverse forms in different forms, like whatever we see just now. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Sarood, you talked about just now about caste system, which was formalized by the Britishers. There was one take of my father on that. I just want to share with the audience. Um, I have to confess, I haven't read those pages of his book. And no. I, I should in order to represent his point to be fairly. But today, but in the political debate in our country, I'm afraid that is a a difference of opinion between the so-called liberal secularists on the one hand and the RSS Hindutva brigade on the other, uh, which I'm not sure your father meant to participate in that argument, but it's today... The debate is not between no, liberal no, no, secularists, it's, it's also, also between about, traditional yeah. conservatives. No, 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 I'm just saying, let's first hear her, which she's been making a point. She's, I, please I finish what to, your... Let, let's hear to, what your father uh -huh. wanted. He said uh, that uh, India is a country of rishis. We are all are all Gotras from the Brahmins to the scheduled caste are of the Rishis. So that's why we say that this is Tapa Bhumi. Here, the caste system it is beyond that. It is because we are all son of the Rishis. So that is the take he had on our Sanatan Dharma. This I just wanted to share because our caste system, as you are saying, was formalized by the British. Mm. He also said mm. it was formalized. And that is a take which he has that those from the Brahmins to the scheduled caste, we all are Gotra, the Rishis Gotra. So we are the, of that, the Pabhumi. So that is all want, I wanted to share with the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Let's. Uh, Shashi, in fact, uh, are you recoiling in horror the at the idea of the entire ancestry being located in saffron? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here, Mrs. Day is here. Uh, Agile, please. Uh, 
can no, you have two or three it's, it's more than just terminology, as you know, but this is probably not the place yeah. for that discussion. No, yeah, there, is there, there. <laughs> Idhar, DJ, please, second row, yes. Aage. I, I would like, uh, Dr. Tharoor had mentioned education, so it's regarding that. I would like to give the devil their due because I know for one fact that the university uh, education system, the British has had laid in their constitution that it should be totally secular. There should be no religious rituals in the university all over India. Secondly, there's the Delhi College, which is 300 years old, all the principals of that college, Britishers, they knew Sanskrit, they knew Arabic, they knew Persian, they were well versed in all these languages. And they encouraged the Muslim students learn Sanskrit and the Hindu students learned Arabic. So I would like to tell you that they encouraged these languages without any religious fervor. And I think we have forgotten all that. You mentioned education, that's how why I was talking to you. Talk. That's a good point. Okay. Uh, yes, friends, here, yeah. third, third row, uh, third row, yes. So we'll have to, you know, uh, I see so many hands. Hi, so okay, last three questions, we'll have to ration our, ration, yes, sir. My name is Sanjay Menon, I'm a policy scholar. So we were discussing about the, how Britishers took over India. So the irony is that we, India is still part of the British Commonwealth, which is uh, directly under the crown. So could you please uh, give some light on that, what is your take? There, there are like views which people say that we should discontinue this. So could you please? It, it was um, a decision that was made really by the Indian government of the day, Jawaharlal Nehru in particular, to continue an association with the, with the British. Uh, you remember, we had actually managed to do the entire exercise as a quote unquote transfer of power rather than a surrender or a capitulation by the British. Uh, and uh, the Congress government of that time went out of their way to ensure there would be no humiliations of the British at the time that they relinquished uh, power in this country. And they, were, they expressed a willingness to remain associated, but they said that we would do so without acknowledging the crown as uh, our sovereign ruler. So they could be, this is, it was thanks to India that the entire distinction was made between the role of the queen or the king as the head of the commonwealth and the authority of the king or the queen as the head of state of each individual constituent country. At that point, the Commonwealth consisted of countries where the king uh, was, in fact, both the head of the Commonwealth and the head of state of Australia, South Africa, Canada, New Zealand, and so on. And we said, no, we're going to be a republic. We're going to have our own pre president as our head of state, but we will acknowledge the king as the head of the Commonwealth. And that formula gave India an opportunity to continue engaging through these other foreign countries in one form of international relations. I would argue that was far more important to us perhaps in the late 40s and early 50s than subsequently. And that gradually the institution of the Commonwealth has been less and less important uh, to the pursuits and objectives of Indian foreign policy. And it's sort of more or less continuing out of habit and also because the Commonwealth is trying in its own modest way to expand its relevance now the majority of members are, are African countries, Caribbean states, and now a couple of countries that were never ruled by the British have applied to and joined the Commonwealth, Rwanda and Mozambique. So it's becoming some other sort of association, and because of our seniority in it and our long presence in it, it'll be one more way in which we can exercise some international influence in the world. I wouldn't go beyond that. But I mean, I, I just want a small question to you. How is the, our presence in the Commonwealth impairing our nationhood. It's not. It doesn't even register on our consciousness in any meaningful way. I mean, the Commonwealth is at best an English-speaking union. That's what it is. And it's a reason, whatever might be its prehistory, it, it's a social club. And it's a club which is very important. I agree with Shashi. In terms of if it enables you to engage with certain countries on the strength of a common history or on the strength of some shared history, so be it. It's, it doesn't necessarily mean you're glorifying empire. It doesn't mean you're genuflecting before the new king. It doesn't mean anything. It at best, in the old days, it used to mean a cricket team once in a while, but even that's gone now. <laughs> 
Okay, great. We have time for just the last uh, one or two questions. I mean, uh, we have five minutes, so we can go on. Yes, there's a. No, I, I think five minutes. Five is minutes today. Yes, sir. Thing. Okay. Yes, please. Just make your question very crisp, please. Yeah. Dr. Sharu, you talk about the British role in education. I think British played a very important role in other things also, like democracy, parliamentary system, and cricket, co commonwealth. So can you share much more about this? I've written pages and pages on exactly that claim uh, in the book. I, 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 I don't credit uh, the British with most of those things. Um, or let me put it this way, I don't think they brought any of those things to India in our interest. They brought them in their interest. Uh, you mentioned cricket. There was something for them to divert themselves and play for. Them. They set up cricket clubs and golf clubs for their own amusement. But because there weren't enough of them, they needed to get so they first had Indians as ball boys, then their Indians to bowl to them. There were no Indian batsmen, there were only Indian bowlers. And then our chaps learned the game and became better at it and eventually started defeating them. So that the same with any other sport. When it comes to things like uh, democracy, the British were spending their entire time trying to deny us democracy. There were people uh, who uh, were certainly qualified to function effectively in, in British councils, but they, they completely restricted how much authority uh, they would grant to Indians at every stage. I mean, to Morley reforms, the Montague Chelmsford reforms. It was a gradual, gradual drip, drip, drip of e expanding authority. And even the last British elections in India in 1946, not even 10% of the population was allowed to vote. There were still qualifications of education, degrees, property ownership, etc., that entitled you to vote. It was never a mass democratic exercise. Yeah. So please understand that uh, the British didn't give democracy. We took it from them with a great deal of effort, and then we expanded it dramatically after we came, uh, became independent. Dramatically yeah. expanded it. So, so uh, I mean, I, 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 anyway, but please read my era of darkness, because all these claims <laughs> for what the British quote unquote gave us democracy, judicial system, rule of law, cricket, every one of those is dealt with in my book. Yeah, uh, I, I have read Shashi's uh, book, which is a sort of a modern version of India today, uh, <laughs> in case any of you have read it. But what's interesting about Shashi's book is that it made far more of a splash in the United Kingdom than it did in India. And I think that tells you a little bit it, I mean, there's a story behind that. <laughs> Empire has ceased to be an obsession with us. But it is something that's become a new obsession within Britain with horrifying results. When Dada Bhai Noroji talked about the un-Britishness of British rule in India, he had a certain ideal. And I think the gentleman there was always talking about that particular ideal in, in, in so far. And, that we never, and they never really live, lived up to that ideal. But it matters far less to us today because as we grow in self-confidence, the empire becomes more and more remote to us. And it's, it's a nice whipping boy once in a while. And you know, best of luck to Shashi to whip it many more times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you. Beyond much. that, I don't think it has any relevance any longer. Thank you very much, friends. A good discussion is one in which there are many more questions that are left unanswered, which means that there is occasion to meet again and discuss these things. It's been a wonderful evening, and I'm so glad that uh, both the panelists have really excelled themselves. Uh, and uh, I think it's been really wonderful. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you, Stopan. We did hope that uh, it was a wonderful. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank uh, you, I request you to be seated for just one more minute. We have a vote of thanks. We'd like to offer a token of appreciation to our panelists. Uh, well, somebody had asked a question about uh, Indian takeover, and I think we don't need to, I feel personally, we don't need to be looking at takeover in terms of battles and treachery. We already have, you know, India takeover in terms of the arts and culture, and that's happening anyway. So I don't think we need to fight battles to take over something. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. With such a discerning panel at hand, it was always a given. And I'm delighted to asseverate this, that not only would we be witness to a tremendously insightful and indeed sagacious discussion, but 
To borrow from a recently used phrase for one of our panelists, be treated to a veritable wizardry of words. Uh, so many, many thanks to both of you and uh, to Dr. Chopra for and conducting the... the <laughs> I would agree with that, college. <laughs> so anyway, th I would like to invite uh, our member secretary intact, Dr. Shodan Charing Mishra, to come up and present a token of our appreciation to our panelists. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to thank all the administration and cultural affairs staff, as well as members from all the other divisions of INTAC, for all their work in the run-up to the event. And thank you, audience, for braving the summer heat to support us. Have a good evening.